What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to Opera Anna. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Anna. I am an opera singer and I am here to opera up your life. Clearly, this is not my normal setup. I am currently in Vienna, Austria for a production of Animal Farm at the Wiener Staatsoper, which is like the craziest sentence I've ever said in my life. So make sure you're following me on Instagram at opera.anna if you want to follow along behind the scenes for that. We have got an aria explained today on the channel, which if you're new here means that we're going to go through an aria together. Together, I'm gonna sort of react to it and explain what's going on as we go through it. And today's aria is one that quite literally changed music as we know it today. Liebes Tod, Richard Wagner's opera Tristan und Isolde. This was a work that was both loved and hated at the time of its premiere, but it undeniably set forth a new way of working with harmony for many composers. The story of Tristan und Isolde comes from an old Celtic legend originally titled Tristan and Isolde that originated around the early 1100s. In my opinion, you can think of Tristan und Isolde, especially the way Wagner presents it as a sort of enchanted, like otherworldly Romeo and Juliet in the sense that they're doomed star-crossed lovers. Everything that transpires is somehow meant to bring them together until we realize that the only place that they can really truly be together is in death. This legend also has many, 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 many variations, including a few in which they don't die at all, but Wagner's version, they for sure do. So how did this opera and this aria change the face of music forever? How could Clara Schumann, the wife of Robert Schumann, but firstly an extremely accomplished pianist and composer in her own right, think it, and I quote, the most disgusting thing I have ever heard in my life, while composer Edward Elger, upon hearing it for the first time, exclaimed, quote, I shall never forget this, later describing the work as, quote, contains the height, the depth, the breadth, the sweetness, the sorrow, the best, and the whole of the best for this world and the next. If we thought opinions were divided today, my God. You see, the story of Tristan und Isolde is one of forbidden love and unfulfilled, more or less, yearning. Two lovers who are not able to be together because of their station, what's expected from them, where they come from, all of these different things. And Wagner gives this idea and this emotion through his music. He translates the feeling of yearning and longing and desire into a very specific musical idea and in a very general sense just makes it feel like the music is never finished. He does this by way in one part with something that we call the Tristan chord. In essence, it's a very simple chord, a half diminished seven chord that we hear right in the first bars of the opera and which sets up the entire musical structure and anticipates antis anticipation for the coming few hours. Like I said, the chord itself is not actually that unique. It's made up of the notes F, B, D sharp, and G sharp, which jazz people, even classical people are like, cool, easy. But it's what Wagner does with the Tristan chord that makes it so unique. As soon as the opera opens, our ear is trying to figure out in what harmonic landscape we're working with and which we'll be plunged into for the next few hours. But by never, ever, ever resolving this chord, the Tristan chord, and also basically any other chord in the opera for that matter, bar after bar, our ear is deceived into thinking that something's going to happen and then doing something completely different. This constant anticipation that Wagner builds up is like the musical equivalent of the depth of emotion that Tristan und Isolde experienced throughout their affair. This set off a chain reaction in composers and listeners and musicologists alike for centuries as people tried to unfold and unpack the use of this chord. But at the end of the day, we can sum it up and conclude what Wagner did with Tristan und Isolde, that he, quote, broke down the rules of harmony, emancipated dissonance, unleashed atonality, and set the foundations four decades early for the musical 20th century. And so the dislike and disdain that some listeners actually felt for the work when it first came out seems logical to me because it's really, really, really annoying for your brain. 
The reason music is universally liked, even if it is in different genres, is because your brain releases dopamine at peak moments of a song and when it anticipates what's going to happen. So you have this sort of like double whammy of dopamine release when you're listening to music and can figure out what's going to happen. But what happens when you anticipate something in music and in life, really, and it doesn't come? Disappointment discomfort, confusion, annoyance, frustration. I could go on and on and on, and they're all negative, as in that they are not happy feelings. You are literally being led on an emotional roller coaster, courtesy of Richard Wagner himself, because as soon as he pulls you out of one dopamine, anticipatory, anticlimax, the next one has already begun. Don't worry about it. We're going to get into it. It's coming. He literally doesn't even give us a chance to land and simultaneously keeps us from realizing it. (laughs) And it's maybe the only way he can drag it out for four hours. If we were constantly getting what we wanted every 10 minutes, we might get bored. And there would be no musical base for Tristan und Isolde's courtship. I can't say Tristan and Isolde's courtship. That feels weird. Tristan und Isolde. So what does this all have to do with our aria for today, Liebestod? I'm so glad you asked. And I'm also so glad that you're still here. So I just wanted to remind you that Opera Anna is now on Patreon, where you can get even more opera content, exclusive behind the scenes footage, exclusive videos, and extended aria explains to opera up your life even more. Where were we? Oh yes. What does this have to do with Liebestod? Instead of telling you, I'm just going to show you because I cannot in words, explain what Wagner does with music. That's why we have music, right? But let's back up. Because if there's anything that a Wagner opera needs, it is context. Oh my God. Do not expect me to walk into an opera of Wagner, of, of Parsifal or The Ring, or even Tristan with Isolde not knowing what's going on. You shouldn't either. Here we go. Tristan, a knight of Cornwall, is sent to bring the Irish princess Isolde to his uncle, King Mark of Cornwall. Funnily enough, Tristan and Isolde have already met each other on a previous journey of Tristan's. Tristan, in this journey, killed Morold, who at the time was Isolde's fiancé. And when he was wounded, she had the chance to avenge Morold by killing Tristan. But instead... She healed his wound and couldn't bring herself to do it. Literally, I am not making this up. He looks in her eyes, not at the sword, not at the wound, not at anything else. He looks in her eyes and she's like, I couldn't do it. You had one job to do. And who knows if that's just a human emotion or if that's that underlying lust. I'm going to go with underlying lust, and I'll tell you why. Tristan is restored to health by Isolde's potions and is allowed to leave with the promise that he will never return. So already at the start of this opera, these two have quite the history. And the fact that she's on this boat going to Cornwall means that Tristan betrayed his promise never to return. Big red flag. Huge. Big mistake. Big. Huge. Isolde wants to avenge Morold wants to punish Tristan for his betrayal and tells Brangena, her handmaid, to prepare a death potion, which she plans to give to Tristan and herself. But instead of a death potion, what does Brangena prepare? I'll give you three guesses. Now, if you said love potion, you are correct. And before these two even reach land, they are hopelessly and forever in love with each other. And in preparing this episode, I was listening to a podcast called The Aria Code, where they also break down things and have different interviews and stuff. It's really cool. Go check it out on Spotify. She said that the love potion that they accidentally take is really just an excuse to enact their destiny, not coming from them itself, but as a means of furthering the story. They are meant to be together. And the love potion just acts as a catalyst, which I thought was an interesting theory depending on how you wrap your mind around destiny and how it actually works. So Tristan and Isolde begin their love affair in Cornwall, well actually in the waters of Cornwall, but it's not long before King Mark, Tristan's uncle and the person he's bringing Isolde to, finds out about them. Of course they have a duel, Tristan is mortally wounded and is brought back to his 
hometown of Brittany in France. And when it's clear that there's really nothing else that they can do, except for maybe call Isolde and have her potions bring him back to life, she is sent for. She gets there, and just as she arrives, he dies in her arms with his name on her lips. Oh, just sounds like that one version of Romeo and Juliet, am I right? To make matters worse, if that weren't bad enough, the king arrives just after Isolde, King Mark, who she was supposed to marry, remember? And Brangaena reveals that she explained everything to him and he just wanted to help them be together now. He doesn't want to come in between their love. He gives them their blessing. I... <laughs> it's so sad. It's already so sad just talking about it. <laughs> ah... Isolde now realizes that she is free to be with Tristan, but unfortunately now there's only one way to find love in death. So they just close the curtains on King Mark and Brangaena. So much to talk about already. So before the aria even starts in the music, Wagner writes, Isolde, die nicht um sie her vernommen, heftet das Auge mit wachsender Begeisterung auf Tristans Leiche. Um, which I think the direction has actually done quite well. There's this idea that she's no longer of this world. She's sort of in this, in her and Tristan's old, own universe. I love that they removed all the other characters from the scene. Normally she is hanging over his body and like looking at him looking up looking at him really so she together with tristan are in front of this nothingness in front of the curtain which whenever this is done for me a removes him from everything that's just happened it seems like there's these two worlds on stage versus what's happening in front of the curtain that's where everyone in this huge battle besides king mark and brand Gaina died and b it gives this sort of strange enchanted feeling of like a no man's land. They're both wearing black. And to me, for all intents and purposes, she is already dead. Although Wagner himself calls a Verklärung or transfiguration. Although if you're me and you didn't know what transfiguration really meant, you like had this idea, but you're like, couldn't explain it to someone else. But another word for it is transformation. The name Liebestod, the name for this aria that is now used basically all the time today, actually came from Wagner's father-in-law, Franz Liszt, quite a few people of you will know, when he made the piano transcription of this scene. The phrase and the word Liebestod, which just means love, death, actually comes from earlier in the opera in Act 2, when they are finally alone and are able to make it official, if you know what I mean. We always know what you mean. <laughs> So you can see that she's looking at Tristan. As soon as you have seen the like three seconds that become before it, that come before it, you know that she's looking at Tristan. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. But she's seeing these things that no one else sees. Mild und leise wie er lächelt, wie das Auge holt er öffnet. Talking about things that belong to a human, to a human body that it should be fully alive. So this is Waltraut Maya, a huge, huge Wagner soprano. My personal favorite in this role, although so many people do it really, really well. And I want to just look at the way she uses the text for a second. One thing that's very, it's very Germanic, not German. 
Germanic because it happens in English too and Dutch too, but God help us if we have to sing in Dutch. When she says das Auge and also when she says er öffnet, these words and also like connections of words that that start on an open vowel and thus require a glottal stop to actually be pronounced correctly. So if she were to connect the words das Auge, das Auge, she would actually be saying something completely different and not just sound weird, but also change the literal meaning of the word. Same goes for, for eröffnet. You would never hear a German person say that eröffnet. It has to have this, this uh, 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 glottal in it. Part of what makes German so difficult to sing, I think. Now she finally looks away from him. Gorgeous. Here it comes. I love that interval that he's... So you think you're on this big climax, which you are, kind of. And then this interval... That's a question. It goes down, but it's a question, which is very interesting. And any other type of music, usually going up means that it's a question. But he goes down and still makes it a question, like... So we feel immediately what's happening through the whole opera, this rise in tension, and then he just brings it straight back down. And so you're like, oh, okay, we're still going. And immediately he's already building up the next line. (sighs) Maya just has this amazing combination in her voice of metal to get over, to get over the orchestra. It's so rich as well. And the, like, (sighs) so much power. It's just fabulous. So this high note, leuchtet, meaning shines. I mean, it has to be a high note. And she sings the crap out of it. It is so good. When she just unleashes everything. Oh, my Lord. We're going to listen to that again. Oh, Oh my God. Listen, the way she just like pings those high notes, it really reminds me of uh, Birgit Nilsson. And it's for some reason very characteristic of of dramatic sopranos or what I've heard a lot in, in Wagnerian sopranos, which I think is, I don't know, really know where that comes from, but I like it. streams out of her jesus christ so until this point the way wagner has sort of kept the orchestra moving in a sense is by writing in tremolos throughout the instruments we talked about tremolos before i'll put up the definition it varies from instrument to instrument at which part they actually have it but it's a very effective way of creating tension it almost sounds like a bee buzzing but then on any pitch that you want now what we get in this section, this new section, etwas bewegter, somewhat faster, is triplets. Again, building up and moving throughout the orchestra so that your ear never really gets used to what's happening. You do have one thing to hold on to, the triplets, but not the notes, not where it's coming from, all these different things. Again, creating this movement. Here we go. Hear the cellos. So 
So you hear that not only does he change what's happening in the orchestra, he changed the entire harmony around it. So he's not only building up climaxes within this section, he then takes us to a different section and does it all over again. Like, and the way that he treats the text is very important because I think literally every single aria that we've looked up until this point on the channel was a combination of the composer and the librettist. Here, Wagner is both. He literally didn't trust anyone. No, that's not why. <laughs> but it's but it's interesting to think about how he treats the music with the text because he was writing both of them, perhaps with one or the other in mind at the same time. So here she says, Freunde, friends, do you see him? Do you hear this? What is, am I the only one? This type of thing. Meanwhile, at the beginning, we have from Wagner himself that she doesn't have any awareness of what's going on around her. So the atmosphere is one of, for me, kind of purgatory. Even though it's not really what it is, that has a like sort of weird negative connotation to it. But she's in this transfiguration. She's in her Verklärung. Oh my god, there's so much happening. All right, let's talk about how she handles these phrases. So we have the words, Seht ihr's nicht, wie das Herz ihm mutig schwillt, voll und her im Busen ihm quillt. The high points of these phrases are on G and an F sharp on the words schwillt and her. Not the same vowel, but very close, and they resemble this E vowel. I'm not sure I've talked about it really in depth here, but the E vowel in your passaggio, so G, F, F sharp, G, F sharp, F, E, is literal death in the voice. It is the worst vowel that a composer can put on those notes for you. It's really hard, if not impossible, to create a real E vowel without compromising a lot of other color in the voice. And you both see and hear in her vowels that they are not actually an E. It's in the shape of the mouth. It's just listening to it. And you can also see how she navigates the whole world, at, the whole world, the whole word going down because she also has an L, Schwilt. In German, it's a much thinner L than we're used to in English. But even so, she is really placing exactly where she's going to put it because she cannot at any second compromise her resonance or else she will get swallowed by that orchestra. Schwa. Right. So we have schwelt, schwelt. She makes almost, she, not almost, she makes a diphthong out of it. It becomes schwelt as she goes down. But it's not a pure u. She's not making an u out of it. It's like this weird combination between e and an open o. Meanwhile, on quilt, which has the exact same vowel as schwelt, and even on the im, on the e, I think it's a much better mix between e and e. I think of it as a mix. Some people might say it's a pure e, but my e vowel ends up being much too weak as an American speak, as an American. I tend to think of it as this like combination between e and e. There's no diphthong in that. Oh. Oh, the flute. 
Yes. Oh, man. God. Okay, 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 okay. So, oh, I got chills. It, this, this music is just, it's amazing. Notice how basically all, all of the phrases have this upward motion. They reach up and up and build and build this tension until we move into yet another harmonic idea. And a lot of times, depending on where we're coming from and where we're going, we get this harmonic musical idea that the heavens open, right? There's this, the key change makes just, just the, that's all I can, that's the only way I can describe it. The heavens open because of the music. Just how can you have that imagery? I don't know. But like when she says lippen in the phrase, how in tender bliss, sweet breath gently wafts from his lips. Let's listen. And a clarinet, oh. So there's the clarinet coming right after that. There's a flute coming in. Again, this swimming sea of sound and harmony that is now her world. She's swimming in him and describing all of these things about him, how his eyes open, how he gently smiles, how he glows ever brighter, how his heart swells, how his lips on and on and on and on. And Wagner, you know, takes this and makes it not just word painting or harmonic undertones, but all of it dials it up to 11, just like. 115. One of my favorite parts in this whole thing is how she says sanft, translated here to gently, and how his breath gently wafts from his lips. My God, if you didn't understand why Wagner was hard to sing before this, I mean, just listen to how much the orchestra is doing. But also these lines are just fucking long. They're so, so long. Thankfully, we have Maya who knows exactly what to do with it. She just leans back into that note, lets it just open her up. Absolutely gorgeous. All this movement in the orchestra, the flutes, the harps, the violins, and whatever brr stands for. <laughs> And what did I say about this vowel modification on these words? She takes that top note on the staff. Zanft entweht is the word. Entweht. She goes entweht. And right at the end puts it back into the, the correct vowel. Va. And right. <laughs> oh my god. Also, I would just like to point out, we have only had a close-up of her face this entire time. That's it. That's it. And I still want to cry. <laughs> she has an amazing interpretation of, of the music, or just not even an interpretation, just like way of being in the music. Um, and like I said, the amount of energy and volume it takes to just get this, vo get your voice over this gigantic orchestra that Wagner's asked for, especially with the continents, especially with the continents. Of course, we hear them here because it's a recording, but you can still tell how much energy she has to put into them, especially on those ending T's. St you would never talk like that. And on Freund, sieht, ugh. Even if it's not Wagner, you basically throw the consonants into the theater if you want it to sound like anything else than a garbled mess of random vowels. So in this next passage, it's a long aria, but we're getting there. Am I the only one who sees and hears this? This amazing, wunderful und leis. So here she's addressing still Freunde, but like I said, is already being transfigured. So it's the question as to whether she's actually talking to King Mark and Brangena at this point, the only two people left alive, or it's this sort of poetic proverbial you, like the world's world, do you not see this? Could Wagner be attempting to break the fourth wall in some sense? I doubt he actually wanted to break it knowing 
his music and his de- nature of dedication to a story. But perhaps this Freunde is a way of involving the universe and by default, the audience watching. I'm going to let it go to the end of this phrase just so you can see how not hyperbolic, but descriptive this text is. Oh, here it comes. She looks again at Susan. So I'm pretty sure you could write a full thesis on this phrase alone. There is so much going on. The main thing I think is that it already gives me chills. I mean, I've had chills this entire time, but we haven't even gotten to the phrase after this one, which will blow your friggin' mind. This is the moment that she is transfiguring into being with him. (laughs) They will now finally be together, finally not be hiding their love and finally able to just live. In death. Okay, I'm so sorry. I just have to stop it here. I really am. But, oh, we're going to get so demonetized. It's just, that's it. I just hope it doesn't get blocked, really. Are they gentle aerial waves swirling around me? Again, this ocean idea, the waves crashing and falling over and over and over again, the way that the sea never stops. It just keeps going. He also does that in the harmonics, in the harmony. Um, And of course, he knew exactly what he was doing when he wrote this text when he put this imagery into the text and don't even we haven't even touched on where he was inspired from with Schopenhauer like there is so much that goes into this of course with every libretto but like the fact that Wagner did all this himself is kind of crazy to me and when I say knew what he was doing with this text there's also yet another not so subtle layer to this one that comes out a lot in romantic german leads usually in which they talk about nature if you know what i mean this is the climax of the opera the climax of the aria and a release eventually for both the audience and isolde so let's go back to the beginning of this section sort of musical build-up thing and see if we can't make it all the way through before I make your blood boil. Like I said, there is really no good place to stop this, and I hope the video doesn't get blocked when I upload it. If it does and I have to go in and cut everything up, then please just know that's why. I don't... I mean, we're watching it together and, like, talking about it. Of course, all of the links for all of the singers that I absolutely love in this in this role are in the description box please go watch them and this is just an informative educational video it is not meant to be the whole thing and just to remind you there will be extended versions of all my aria explains on the patreon and hopefully for this one we'll have a special guest who's going to talk to us more about the orchestra um because we haven't even scratched the surface of it of everything going on in this aria. So if you're not a patron, the link is in the description box. 
And if you're just here for the ride, that's fine too. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel and leave a comment because I wanna know what maybe for some of you is the first time listening to a Wagner aria. Now, even though I just said we'll have someone on the Patreon come in and talk about the orchestra, I just wanna <laughs> bring your attention to the orchestra for a half a second. Sometimes it's interesting, interesting to tune out the voice and just focus on what the orchestra is doing because there's a certain point in this little section that they repeat three notes over and over and over and over and over again. Just think about how this idea of repetition couples with the text. Just fair warning, I am going to stop it just before the end, before the text changes a bit because it's quite a dense text. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. So you can probably tell why I wanted to watch it all the way through once, not only to get the full effect, but because it is so hard to find a place to stop. <laughs> We've talked about it before on this channel, but um, Wagner is the king and perhaps the first real practicer of this through composed technique. Um, and in fact, Tristan und Isolde was not an opera an opera in his eyes, but he called it eine Handlung, uh, so a, a drama or an action. But you just have to think about the fact that she's been seeing this for four hours and there's still so much voice and energy in this. And it's just a close-up of her face. It's just a close-up of her face. This is what opera singing is meant to be, no? Expressive and overwhelming and fun and moving just from the voice and what the singer does with it. She's not running around on stage doing a crazy ton of things. I mean, Wagner sets you up for success, of course, but you have to be ready for it, right? I would love to know what her subtext is because there's clearly so much going on in her head that is creating this tapestry of emotion on her face, um, which makes it absolutely fascinating to watch, I think. And if, I, you know, if every singer was like this, then I definitely wouldn't mind just the park and bark style of singing. You know, if everyone sang like this, oh my God. I don't want to look away for a single second. It's just, there's so much going on.
to say. Oh, God, it is so pretty. Oh, and you finally we get this. <clears throat> it's resolved and it's, you know, they're together. And I think that's so beautiful. <sighs> First time I watched this all the way through, I was crying like a baby. Crying like a baby. Oh my god. But I really I also wonder what this was like in the hall. Both visually and vocally. I mean, right now, again, we're just looking at her face. Um, vocally, I know she's the perfect Wagnerian singer, so I don't think it I'm not asking like audibly or something, but you know, just the sonic waves hitting your ear live must have been crazy. And then just looking at it, like if you're in the balcony looking down, she does a great job of opening herself up. And thankfully, the aria is part of that. So it fits so much to the character. Um, and Tristan, I don't know where exactly he is in all this. He's just standing sort of downstage from her, as it were. Um, and she looks at him sometimes. You can see if, if he's just here when she starts, it's just them for a second. And then as soon as she say, says, um, Seht ihr's nicht, or something. Seht ihr's nicht, Freunde. One of those ones. She, she, right before she turns out. So this ending scene, this like two second thing that probably costs like $5,000 to stage. <laughs> More than that. It's just King Mark and Prangena standing over their graves, and it 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 it's almost this like fairy tale like ending. The lighting and the way they're standing, it's just it's gives it's giving Sleeping Beauty. You know what I mean? Like I wonder if they did that on purpose. You know, there's lighting artists and everything that think about this all day. But in any case, Tristan und Isolde are now at peace and can be together forever in death. I told you it was Romeo and Juliet. I told you. Thank you so much for joining me today to opera up your life. This aria really deserves a two hour long aria explained. At least there is so much to talk about. And I'm just so honored if you made it this far in the video. I really love being able to share and discover opera with you guys. Please let me know what you thought of Waltraud Meyer, the opera, everything. I wish I could have you all here with me so we could just talk about it forever because um, it's fascinating and amazing. And I'm just so sad that I never got to see her live. She's stunning. It's stunning. And I hope you're all able to join me over on the Patreon to talk even more about this aria coming soon with a special guest. But otherwise, you can follow me on Instagram at opera.anna to opera up your life every day. And I will see you in the next one. Adio. Adio.